So, Father, it seems that that's what you keep asking us. Don't you want somebody to love? Wouldn't you love somebody to love? The garden flowers, look around, they're dead. Your mind is full of red. The tears are running down your cheeks. Now, wouldn't you love somebody to love? Father, I pray that you would help us to ask that question and to answer that question honestly. I pray that you'd help us to preach. In Jesus' name, amen. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Love is strong as death. Jealousy, passion, is fierce as the grave, Sheol. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of Yahweh, of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. A lawyer once asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And he responded, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it, homoios. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus is quoting the law in Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. In Song of Solomon 8, Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19, the word translated love is the Hebrew word ahab, the verb, or ahaba, the noun, in New Testament Greek, in the Septuagint, that gets translated as agapeo, the verb, and agape, the noun. You shall love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. That is, with all you got. Which would obviously mean that you'd never be tempted to love really anything else. For you wouldn't have anything else to love anything else with, right? Which would obviously mean that you would never sin, and everything that you would ever do would be worship, right? If you loved with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. You know, it's really hard to get people to come to worship services. I know this because of my history. It's hard to get people to come to worship services without promises of endless bliss in heaven and threats of endless torture in hell. People want bliss and don't want torture, but to just love God? Uh, not so much. So to answer the question, don't you want somebody to love? Well, I don't think we really want God to love all that much. Jesus says the second command is like it or somehow is it, homoios. That's the only way um, really to make sense of these two commandments and what Jesus says if the second command is, is like it or is it, think it through. If you love God with all you have, then you have no love left over with which to love your neighbor, right? Unless your neighbor and yourself contained God, as if you yourself and your neighbor was somehow a temple of God, or somehow channel God as you, if you and, and your neighbor were somehow blood vessels in the very body of God, in which case you could love God with God in your neighbor and yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now that obviously means, obviously means that if all things being equal, you had $1,000 and your neighbor had no dollars, you would want, you would desire to give your neighbor at least, at least $500. So don't you want neighbors? Don't you want somebody to love? Well, maybe, obviously, no. <laughs> not so much, not so much. Do you know that through a group like World Vision or Compassion International, or actually I didn't look up the numbers on Compassion, but this is from World Vision, you can sponsor a child that might otherwise starve in a developing nation for about a dollar a day, get pictures, letters, keep them fed and educated too. 
That means that if Americans sponsored children at the rate we fund our military, according to my calculations, provided charities could process all the money, we could sponsor two billion children every day of every year. And if we sponsored them at the rate at which we fund or pay for our pets, we could sponsor 2.7 billion children every day, every year. Now, I realize that there are complications with that. I realize that a country needs a military and it's wonderful to have pets. But we could, we could do that and still save the world from famine. I'm just saying maybe we don't want somebody to love all that much. There's a picture of a, of a leper. One of the more pleasant pictures I've found on the internet. Leprosy is a very rare disease in the United States of America. Just a few years ago, the last leper colony in the U.S., located in Carville, Louisiana, um, closed its doors. You won't find much leprosy in Denver, Colorado, but you'll find a lot of lepers, so to speak. People that are unattractive and in deep need. People with physical, emotional, spiritual handicaps. People that, well, they could get you sick. Poor people, difficult people, lonely people, sad people, boring people, grumpy people, even sinful people. I think there are lepers all around you. Right here, right now, in this very room. Just look around. Lepers. Don't you want somebody to love? Jesus touched lepers. You know, if you touch a leper, you can contract that leper's disease. You might think, well, Jesus didn't contract their disease, but that's not really true, is it? This is what Isaiah writes. His appearance, his face was, was marred beyond any human likeness, despised and rejected, one from whom men hide their faces. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know why he subjected himself to us all and to our sin and to our sorrow and suffered your iniquity? You know, he didn't have to. He makes that clear. He wanted to. I think he wanted somebody to love. I mean, he loves love. God is love. He is relentless love. I think if you said that in Hebrew, you'd probably use the word hesed, which gets translated mercy or steadfast love. It's ahaba that just won't quit. This is what the Lord requires of you, wrote Amos the prophet, that you, that you love mercy, that you ahab what he, what he writes is, you will hob hesed, that you desire relentless love, that you love love. God is love. Agape in Greek, ahaba in Hebrew, the noun and the verb. So you should, I'm telling you, you should want somebody to love. You should love love. But that's the catch. We really can't shoot ourselves into love, can we? The more we force love, the less we often do love, and the more we often fake love. That's called, I think, religion. Love that is force is like kissing your grandma when you're seven because your mom says you have to or you won't get your allowance. <laughs> Amen. Love that's force is like square dancing in gym class in order to get a grade. The law, what you should do, reveals what you don't want to do. That's why it's a law. It reveals, that, it reveals that, that you don't want to do what you're supposed to do. The law reveals that you don't love love. So it is the knowledge of evil. But it can't make you good. It can't make you love love, and God is love and the good. But... If we believe the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, maybe we would love love. In 1978, I took this girl to a dance, and I kissed her. 
And it was an entirely different experience than kissing my grandma when I was seven, because I had to. Song of Solomon chapter eight is the last chapter of the Song of Solomon. And chapter eight, verses six through seven is like the theological pinnacle of the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon is an erotic love poem. And it starts like this. Chapter one, verse one, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Song, and, song of Songs is a Hebrew way of saying, this is the best song, <laughs> the best song. And uh, which is Solomon's could mean that it's written by Solomon or commissioned or received by Solomon and possibly about Solomon. Whatever the case, Solomon is a character in the song as well as the daughters of Jerusalem, a bunch of queens and concubines. But the main character is a peasant girl who yearns for a shepherd who yearns for her and calls her his bride. Many have thought that the shepherd is Solomon, but many scholars today think that the shepherd must be uh, someone else. And that makes sense to me, since the shepherd and the peasant girl appear to have a monogamous relationship, and we know that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, that's a thousand women, and, 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 and the woman says, I am my beloved's plus 999 other, no, I don't think so, so much. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine, says the peasant girl, about the shepherd. In this scenario, Solomon and the queens, concubines, daughters of Jerusalem represent like an idyllic uh, relationship between God and all of Israel, a relationship that is like a foil or perhaps a backdrop for this love affair between the shepherd and this peasant girl. Whatever the case, the song is clearly a set of erotic love poems in which the two lovers seem to keep yearning and seeking and finding and seeking. I mean, it's filled with imagery, too, imagery that harkens back to the Garden of Eden, and it even includes a, a tree, literally a tree of breath, a, a breath tree, which is usually translated apple tree. Tapuak is translated apple or apple tree. Tapuak. Puak is translated blow or puff, as in, you know, puff on a flame and turn it into a fire. Uh, Nafak is blow or, or breathe, as in God breathed into the dust and made Adam, humanity. If the song has a plot, it is about a young woman surrendering her virginity, her garden, to this shepherd under this tree, which is himself. That this book is in the canon of Scripture at all is rather surprising. Religious Jews have seen it simply as an allegory referring to Yahweh and Israel, and so in that way downplayed the erotic element. Religious Christians have seen it as an allegory referring to Christ and the church, and so in that way downplayed the erotic element. I think it is an allegory. But it's more than an allegory. It's what theologians would call a sacrament, a sign, but also the substance that the sign points to. That Solomon wrote the song makes sense to me for three reasons. Number one, I don't think it would have been included in the canon of Scripture if King Solomon hadn't written it. Know what I mean? Number two, Solomon would have discerned what so many, Solomon with wisdom, would have discerned what so many people fail to discern, what should be obvious to any serious student of the Bible. A love story is the theme of the entire Scripture, the entire, the entire Bible. And number three, the Song of Songs just, well, it makes sense in the mouth of old King Solomon who's had relations with a thousand different women Written Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and now reflects back on the very best thing. The, he sings about the best thing, the best song, and so writes about faithful love between this peasant girl and this, this shepherd. And this, I would imagine, is what wisdom had taught him. In fact, it might be most fruitful to think of Solomon as the bride and wisdom as the shepherd the bridegroom. So let's read a smattering, okay? Chapter 2, verse 3. As an apple tree, tapuak, 
among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, the house of wine, and his banner over me was Ahaba. Verse 10, my beloved lifts up his voice. He says to me, come then, my love, my lovely one, come. For see, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the season of glad songs has come, the cooing of the turtle dove is heard in our land, the fig tree is forming its first figs, and the blossoming vines give out their fragrance. Come then, my love, my lovely one, come, my dove, hiding in the cliffs of the rock, in the coverts of the cliff, show me your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is beautiful. Verse 16, my beloved is mine and I am his. He pastures his flock among the lilies. Chapter three, verse 11, go out, O daughters of Zion, and look upon King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. Chapter four, verse 12, now the shepherd sings, a garden locked is my sister, my bride. A spring locked, a fountain sealed, your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with all choicest fruits, henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all choice spices, a garden fountain, a well of living water, and flowing streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, come, O south wind, blow, puak, blow, puff upon my garden. Last week I shared that in this very miraculous way, Jesus once said to me, Peter, I've never stopped kissing you. Sometimes my kisses are sweet, sometimes they burn. But believe this, my kisses never stop. I love you. That's what Susan heard for me during worship 12 years ago on the last night that I felt this bizarre puffing. I would feel it like one time I even saw my notes move underneath it, this puffing. And I, for months, I asked, what are you doing? I just, like that, over and over again. I felt it for months at a time in which I, I desperately wanted to quit everything. Verse 16, awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind. Blow, puff upon my garden, let its spices flow. Now the bride sings, let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. Now the shepherd sings, I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my, will, my milk. And, and now a chorus of people sing, eat friends, drink and be drunk with love. Or possibly drunk by love. Chapter eight, the bride sings, oh, that you were like a brother to me who nursed at my mother's breast. If I found you outside, I would kiss you and none would despise me. You see, it seems that they're not yet married, and so people would despise open displays of affection. If, in fact, this young man were not her brother, but he's not her brother, at least not in that way. Verse two, I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother. Scholars argue that this is a euphemism for female anatomy. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, she who used to teach me. I would give you spiced wine to drink, the juice of my pomegranate. His, his left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. She talks as if love were sleeping in the sanctuary of everyone's soul until it is awakened and takes a person on a wild and wonderful and yet very painful adventure. Verse five, who is that coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Perhaps she learned to lean on her beloved in the wilderness. Under the apple tree, Tapuak, I awakened you. There your mother was in labor with you. There she who bore you was in labor. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy, passion is fierce as Sheol, as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord, Shalabet Yah, the raging fire of Yahweh. 
Many wise waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. In other words, if a man offered to trade everything that he would have for, his, for, for love, it, was, it still wouldn't be enough. That's how desirable it is. But you see, I think we see love as a duty, don't we? As a painful, undesirable duty. But if we saw love truly, we would see that love is desirable above all things. So no one would have to command us to love love. We would see that love is desirable above all things. See, nobody told me that I should desire Susan in those tight white polyester pants that she wore to Heritage High School in 1977 as she gracefully walked up the stairs in front of me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday between classes. Imagine if I stood up on our wedding day at the reception and I said this, I am so proud of my accomplishment. I was told that I should love Susan and so I decided to love Susan. It's really tough to love Susan, but I endured. And now I look forward to some reward like good cooking and a clean house. Isn't that the substance of what we often say at church? I'm proud to be a Christian. We should all love Jesus, and so I decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. It's tough, but I love God, and so I can't wait to get some reward from God. You know, streets of gold and maybe a certificate saying that I have conquered God and his kingdom. But you see, if I really believe that love was as desirable as Solomon says, for me, at that moment, love would not be a duty. In fact, love would be its own reward, and there could be no possible greater reward. I wouldn't be proud of love, but what? I would be endlessly grateful that I could love love, and I would have compassion for people that don't love Love. In other words, sinners that have compassion for sinners. Sinners are people that don't love love, and so already they're trapped by hell. It's my experience as a pastor and as a person that Christians normally don't have compassion for sinners. Instead, we're jealous of sinners, like they got away with something. Which reveals that not only do we not love love, we actively despise love. In fact, I think we'd crucify love. If we got the chance, thought we could get away with it. Jesus says, you shall love God and you shall love your neighbor. But it's interesting that he doesn't use the imperative tense. He uses the indicative tense, which is really clear in the Greek. He didn't say you should, but literally he said you will. That means that this is not just a command. <laughs> it's a prophecy. And a promise, a promise. I, you know, I went to sixth grade with Susan. I don't... I don't even remember her. I must have seen her every day, I don't remember. Love had not yet awakened in me. But imagine if God appeared to me on the playground in sixth grade and said, you better love that awkward, toe-headed, freckle-faced girl over there. You better love her with all your heart and all your mind and all of your soul. And Peter, if you don't, I'm gonna fry you in hell forever and ever and ever. We see, at that point, I might have had a hard time, you know, feeling it, right? And I probably would have become an ax murderer. But imagine if God appeared to me and said, Peter, you, you, oh, you will love that little toe-headed, freckle-faced, awkward girl over there. You don't feel it now, but trust me, you will feel it then. She will be the delight of your eyes, the joy of your heart, and awaken in you wonders that you cannot now even comprehend. I would have thought, that's weird. But it might have, it might have given me some hope, caused me to be a little bit nicer to the freckle-faced, toe-headed, awkward girl. Imagine if he said, Peter, you will one day love everyone that way. And you will love love that way. 
I used to play the piano. Or I should say, I practiced the piano because my mom made me. And when she stopped requiring it, I quit. But if I had met Michael Hanna, or if I had just listened to the piano solo in Leonard Skinner's Call Me the Breeze, I don't think I would have quit. Practice would have still been painful, hard, and undesirable, but I would have, I would have kept practicing because I so desired to play along to Call Me the Breeze. If we really saw love and trusted love, if we had faith in love, I think we'd practice love in the hope of one day playing along. If we were to see the face of love, I think maybe we'd even touch lepers. You know, like every chance that we got, all in the hope of one day playing along. Is life just one great school of love, asked Richard Rohr, and then he answers, yes, I think it is. Love is the lesson. Well, the Song of Solomon reveals that, number one, love is desirable above all things, and number two, love is more powerful than, than anything. But we don't believe that. That's why people hate it when I preach on this topic. I think they long for love but believe that love has failed. So let me remind you that the sexual love depicted in the Song of Solomon is sacramental. That means that it's a sign that contains the substance of the very thing that it's pointing to. So if you don't experience the sign or don't experience in the same way as me, it doesn't mean that the substance is not literally all around you, as if in it you live and move and have your being. If you're gluten intolerant and allergic to wine, Jesus still gives you his body and blood, and you are constantly surrounded by grace. Don't confuse the sign for the substance, but at the same time, don't be tricked into thinking there is no substance in the sign. Because there is. And that's why God cares about your sex life. And that's why the Song of Solomon is not simply an allegory. And that's why I want you all to have hope, all of you. People hate this topic because they've tasted a bit of love, but then they've given up on love and they've listened to the liar who tells them that their hope is in vain and, and probably even evil. We'll think about Solomon. I mean, if anyone in all of Scripture had a messed up sex life, it was Solomon. 700 wives, 300 concubines, and no Viagra. I'm just saying, Solomon had some issues. First Kings chapter 11 makes it clear that all of his sexual dalliances really messed up his relationship with the Lord. And yet, and yet, Solomon could still recognize the substance in the sign and write, love, Ahaba, is strong as death. He knew that even if he gave up on love, love would not give up on him. So maybe you've given up on love. And disappointment haunts all of your dreams. Maybe you loved a lover and you lost that lover. Perhaps that lover recently died. Listen closely. Love is strong as death. Maybe you think love is only true in fairy tales, meant for someone else, but not for me. Listen closely. You cannot escape love. Because nothing is as strong as love. Maybe you had love and you lost love and you think love will love escape me. Well, in the Song of Solomon, you know, the young bride, if you read it, you'll know she keeps losing her lover and seeking her lover and finding her lover and losing her lover. There's all this yearning and longing and seeking and finding and then yearning. Do you ever wonder why Jesus can seem so real at times and yet so far away at other times? Maybe he wants you to seek him like he constantly seeks you. And maybe he wants you to see that he's not a thing that you can control or some sort of divine harlot, you know, that you could purchase and keep in a box and then use whenever you would like to. Maybe he's playing hard to get. 
so that when he gives himself to you, you'll be ever more grateful that you've gotten him and all things with him in an infinite communion of free and extravagant love that is love, who is God. Maybe you loved and your love was unrequited, and so you think to yourself, oh, my, oh, my love was wasted. Well, you need to know that love is never wasted. So love your neighbor, whether or not they love you in return. Love your enemies. Love those that revile you and persecute you and kick you out of the synagogues. Love your dog. Love your pets. You know, it turns out that there isn't a shortage of food or dog food in this world so much as a shortage of love. And you're being trained to love love. And love is never wasted. Love is strong as death and fierce as hell. Remember the first death was experienced when Adam took the life from the tree in the middle of the garden, hid himself in fig leaves and self-justifications. He imprisoned himself in his own psyche, his own ego, first death. Second death is experienced when Adam, who is the eschatos Eve, humanity is Eve, when humanity returns to the tree, the tree that now looks like a cross, and surrenders the life, which is uh, the death of our psyche, our, our ego, what we think is ourselves. The second death is the death of death and the presence of eternal life. The second death is losing your lonely, old, arrogant self and finding your new self lost in love that is God, your bridegroom. The second death is literally the destruction of hell in the fiery love that is God. Love is strong as death, fierce as hell, and love does not fail. So life is a school of love. Love is your teacher who does not fail. Even when you fail, that's when love teaches the greatest lesson. Love is your teacher, love does not fail, and loving love is the lesson. So life is not just a school. Life is not just an internship. Life is a romance. You are being romanced by the Almighty, who has the hearts for you and will not fail. Love does not fail, writes Paul, and yet, and yet love does wait until it pleases. I adjure you, daughters of Jerusalem, do not awaken love before it pleases. If you experience the unmitigated love of God too soon, you'll perceive that love as rape and not surrender your garden. In other words, love will utterly it will utterly obliterate the arrogant little self-centered prison of a psyche that you think is your life. And if this happens too soon, before it pleases, you will experience this liberation as burning pain rather than the burning love that it truly, truly is. And so you won't freely surrender your garden, which is the temple destined to be filled with the eternal fire, the fire that now sleeps in the Holy of Holies in the sanctuary of your soul behind the veil. So cool. Anyway, Song of Solomon reveals that number one, love is desirable above all things. Number two, love is more powerful than anything. And number three, love desires you and cannot be stopped. It is the very flame of the Lord. Shalabet Yah, the flame of Yahweh. It's not just the way it seems. Love really is out to get you. God is love. God is a consuming fire, and love is the very flame of the Lord. That's not simply a metaphorical statement. I'm saying it's also an ontological assertion. If I say the lips of my beloved are roses, I mean that her lips are red and beautiful like roses, but do not ontologically consist of roses. But when I say God is love and love is fire, I mean that one day I think you will look into the face of the Lord shining like the sun, and I suspect that you will think every fire, every fire I've ever seen is but a shadow of this. Every flame I've ever touched is like a sacramental representation of this. Every love I've ever felt and then sought and then mourned, but it was nothing but a longing for him who is the light and brighter, brighter than the sun. Well, if you want to fall in love with the sun, 
Don't just go stare into the face of the sun at, at noonday, because you'll go blind, won't be able to see anything. And yet if you stare at a single flame burning in the darkness, you'll come to know the glory of the sun. And then you'll fall in love with the sun. And the sun, S-O-N, the light of, of the world. Hopefully you, I don't think most people know this, but hopefully you remember that before the fall, something was desperately wrong with Adam, the Adam. He was in the presence of God. That means before his face. He was in the presence of God, but didn't recognize God, who is his helper. He couldn't see love who was right there standing next to him. I mean, can you imagine such a thing? And then we find that something was terribly wrong with Eve because she didn't trust the word of love, who is the wisdom of God, the logic of love. Can you, can you imagine? God told Adam and Eve, the day you eat of it, dying you will die. That was the beginning of the sixth day. Long before the seventh day when everything is good and it is finished. But on the sixth day, they didn't trust love. So what does love do? He doesn't simply teach a class on good and evil. He doesn't simply teach a class on love and not love. He doesn't simply grant them an internship in the school of life. He romances them with everything that he has and everything that he is. He hangs himself. His heart the good in flesh, the life. He hangs his heart on a tree in the middle of the garden. Then he appears to leave humanity alone with the liar, the, the snake. He allows them, he even arranges for them. He arranges for humanity to take his life and abuse his love, which is himself. And, and then he kicks them out of the garden. But then he leaves the garden with them. Like we saw a few weeks ago, he's taken him on a journey, a walkabout that we've been talking about the last four messages. What's he doing? He's romancing them. He takes them on a journey, for in the far country, in the valley of the shadow, the shadow of death, he'll reveal the glory of his love in a dry garden on a tree, a tree that we now call the cross. There he entered our hell and spoke for us a thing that we couldn't speak, our greatest fear. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? According to an old friend, Pierre Benoit, he wasn't my friend, but this old friend studied Pierre Benoit, the French theologian. Supposedly he spent 35 years studying and praying through that statement. And Finally, in, in prayer and study, he was convinced that at that moment when Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He heard the Father say this, Come, my love, my lovely one, come. Winter is past. The season of glad songs has come. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your face is beautiful. Come, my lovely one, come. And at that, Jesus delivered up his breath upon the tree of breath, the breath that descends upon his bride on Pentecost, the breath that he gives to you, his beloved. There on that tree, he reveals that what we have taken, the life that we have taken has always been given, forgiven. That's the glory of God. That's the light shining in the darkness, the light that is the glory of God, the light that shines in the face of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and the light that shines in the face of Christ risen from the dead and ruling the nations. And, and now He asks you, don't you want somebody to love? You see, you literally have been forgiven God and all things with Him. The one forgiven little loves little, but, but, but you have been forgiven much. And loving much is the image and likeness of God. Don't you want to be the image and likeness of God? I think you're starting to say, yes. That's why you're here. And so in this way, we return home and we know the place for the first time. 
We see the glory of God in everything that's anything. We see love, for we've come to know the good, who is the life, constantly given to us on a tree in the middle of the garden city, which is the new Jerusalem. We see love, and we hear singing. Everyone singing. Singing what? The songs, the song of songs. Every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is within them, praising the Lamb upon the throne and singing, worthy are you the lamb and the shepherd. And that's why you ought to come to worship each week. That's why you ought to come uh, to worship, hear the word, taste the bread, drink the wine, and try to sing the songs that one day you might sing along. And that's why you ought to join a community group in the fall when we start forming them. Confess your sins one to another and listen to your neighbor as they say in the name of Jesus you're forgiven. And then love, 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 love along, play along, and that's why you need to touch lepers. Not even so much because they need to be touched, but because you need to touch them in the hope that you might see the glory of God shining in the face of Christ the light that shines in the darkness. Preparing this message, I couldn't help but remember a story that my old friend, Brendan Manning, who used to study Pierre Benoit, used to share. In the 1980s, Brennan volunteered at Carville, a leper colony in Louisiana. One dark and dreary day, just after he arrived, the nurse grabbed him and said, Brennan, you have to go see Yolanda, I think Yolanda's time is, is short. Yolanda was 37 years old. She had contracted leprosy five years earlier. Brennan uh, used to share that anyone could just tell that she had once been a stunning beauty. Beautiful, large, brown eyes, chiseled uh, cheeks, a lovely figure. But now her mouth was distorted. Her nose was eaten away and pressed in. Her ears were distended, and leprosy had taken away, eaten away all of her fingers. Two years earlier, her husband had left her and now wouldn't allow their two sons, 14 and 16, to come visit. Brennan prayed with her and had turned to put the lid back on the anointing oil, anointing oil when he said all at once the room filled with light. He thought to himself, oh, the sun just came out from behind the clouds. But then turning, he realized that the light was coming from Yolanda's face. Not knowing what to say in that moment, he said, Yolanda, you look happy. She said, oh, Father, I am he said, why? She said, because the father of Jesus just told me that he is coming to get me and taking me home today. After a long silence and some tears, Brennan said, Yolanda, what did he say to you? And she answered, this is what he said, Brennan. He said, come. Come, my lovely one, come. For you, the winter's past. The snows are over and gone. The flowers appear in our land. The season of joyful songs has come. The cooing of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Come now, my love, my lovely one, come. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet and your face is beautiful. Come now, my love, my lovely one, come. And six hours later, Yolanda expired this age and inspired the age to come, the age that is. Shortly after that, Brennan discovered that Yolanda had been illiterate. She had never read the Bible. But the Word of God was not dead in Yolanda. He had risen from the dead, passed through her lips, and carried her home. Love is strong as death. He is fierce as the grave. 
His flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of Yahweh. And so on that night, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant. And remember, like we talked about, it's, it's a marriage covenant. This is the covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. And so, daughters of Jerusalem, may you now present yourself in the words of Paul in Romans chapter 12. May you present yourself, may you present your bodies, may you present your flesh a living sacrifice to our God who is love and fire. Amen. Then I saw her face Now I'm a believer And not a trace Of doubt in my mind I'm in love I'm a believer I couldn't leave her if I tried Oh, I'm in love I'm a believer I couldn't leave him if I tried I'm a believer, I couldn't leave her if I tried. Amen. I mean, I just think it's kind of cool because uh, people will say sometimes, you know, I don't believe in God. And they go, that's weird because I think you maybe worship him all the time and you don't even know it because God is love and love will not fail. And the deepest yearnings of your heart are always for him. And that means every love song ever written, no matter how warped it gets by our own sin and our failure, at its root, it's about Jesus. So anyway, we didn't finish the Song of uh, Solomon. Stay standing, though, because this will be uh, really quick. The Song of Solomon ends the way the Bible ends, okay? Listen, Song of Solomon 8.11, I don't have my glasses, but it goes like this. Um, Solomon had a vineyard at Balhamon. Um, he let out the vineyard to keepers. Each one was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, my very own, it's, it's the woman talking now, is before me. It's mine. You, O Solomon, may have the thousand. You can have your thousand. And the keepers of the fruit, maybe keepers of the harem, they can have 200. And then he, oh, you who dwell in the gardens, he's talking, you who dwell in the gardens with companions listening for your voice, let me hear it. I think maybe he's talking to us. We dwell in the gardens listening for our voice. And then she, the peasant girl, answers, make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. And that's how the Song of Solomon ends. That's also how the Bible ends. Revelation chapter 22, the spirit and the bride say, come. Surely I'm coming soon, he answers. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come. That's how the world ends. And everything begins. So believe the gospel in Jesus' name. And uh, listen, this sermon was really the conclusion of the last four. I didn't see that when I started out, but um, that would help you understand this sermon. And also, on Tuesday at 6, if you want to join our Chew the Fat group, we just discuss these things. And I don't have a bunch of questions prepared or whatever, so it's kind of whatever um, you might want to talk about. And this sermon should have given us some stuff to talk about. Uh, also, before you go, let me say members of the prayer team will be down front here, and they'd love to um, pray with you. But in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our God who is love, believe the good news. Amen. Amen.